My name's Scott Redmond. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks, Katya, for a good talk. And thank you, Guy and Steve, for uh, asking me to talk at this meeting. Uh, and I'd like to welcome all the new people, Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new and you're at this meeting, <laughs> man, what a trip. What a trip to take to your first meeting or to your second meeting or to your tenth meeting or just in your first bunch of months. It's really remarkable. Is the, are the newlyweds here? Are the people who got married here? Are they? They shouldn't be here. They're actually here? Wow. Okay. Hi, guys. Congratulations. Uh, it was really great. It was so beautiful. And Nancy and I were talking about it. It was, it was exactly like our wedding without the vomiting and the fighting. It was like, <laughs> it was like uh, being at the same wedding without the puking and the, and the fighting. And um, uh, my, two of my favorite parts of our wedding was when Nancy's sister got tired and, and laid down on the dance floor. And when my brother laid uh, on his back and puked right up into the air. That was... Uh, <laughs> That was just like being at Yellowstone Park. It was, really it was great. It was really great. And our, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I come from a, a, a Jewish family from the dark side of the Balkans, and Nancy's half Russian Jew and half like Seminole Indian, like half. And uh, so our wedding looked like a PBS experiment with two cultures eating dinner together. It was this bizarre uh, uh, group of people. Um, uh, I'd like, again, I'd like to welcome you if you're... Can I see the hands of people in their first year? Wow. Wow. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. I'd like to tell you that I have a great life today, and if you're new, I'm sure that just thrills the shit out of you. I'm sure, that, <laughs> I'm sure you're just overjoyed for me. And I... Uh, <laughs> I, I know that because I was so happy for the people having a good time when I got here. I just was thrilled to death for them. And I, I used to sit in my old home group and, and listen to people talk about the new house and the new car and the new family, you know, and the new job. And I'd sit there and I'd think, you know, maybe you'll go home tonight and, uh, and maybe your house will blow up. <laughs> maybe you'll blow up and then we'll see how spiritual you are next week. So if you're new, I'd like to welcome you to AA. And uh, I, uh, if you're anything like me, part of you is looking around this room tonight and saying to yourself, Alcoholics Anonymous, how did I wind up in Alcoholics Anonymous? How lame is this? This is beyond lame. This is beyond church, beyond synagogue. This is some plateau of lameness I never even imagined was available to me. Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> you are now privy to an unending, unsolicited reservoir of information and advice. <laughs> they are going to get right up into your face and talk this endless AA crap to you. Now, the place I got sober was a place called Unit A in North Hollywood, right next to the Tonga Hut. Now, I know that if Satan does, is manifested on Earth, he is manifested in the form of Polynesian-themed uh, bars. This is my personal feather. It's those big carved heads and those poo-poo platters and all that stuff, man. That, it, they're, they're really like, they're like psychological theme parks. Those bars are just unbelievable, you know. And I got sober right next door to one at the end of the earth. Everyone had one tooth with a cavity in it. It was the end of the earth, you know. And that guy got right up in my face. You know the guy. He's got a belt buckle large enough to serve a whole fish on. You know the guy, right? <laughs> Do I want what you've got? No. No, but thanks for spitting on me. I really appreciate it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I had a terrible journey to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was brought up in the Bronx, New York City. Now, I, I got to tell you, I, 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 it's pretty much over now. My, one of my favorite... Uh, activities that a sober club met is at least for the first 24 hours is just to watch the New Yorkers try to relax. Just to watch. You know? It's just great. You know, you see him in his shades, you know, in the sun like this. Just pissed off in paradise, you know? And it, it starts to loosen up. Uh, like you watch him in the sun, it's like watching a penny in a hot frying pan. They're still jiggling a little bit, you know? But it, it just, it calms down. And it's no fun anymore. They're pretty much, you know, it's over. They're relaxed now. 
Um, <laughs> uh, and I w- was brought up in the, uh, in the Bronx in New York City to a completely insane family. My family was nuts. They're still nuts. Uh, 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 I think it was last year. My mother called me saying, oh, I, got, I have really bad news for you, honey. I said, what? She said, oh, your, uh, your Aunt Lee is dead. I said, oh, no, Mom, when did that happen? She said, two years ago. (laughs) I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean two years ago? She said, well, you know, your Aunt Phyllis is back in the mental institution. She calls me and harasses me, so I haven't picked up the phone. But I just found out Phyllis is dead, so I started picking the phone up again. They finally reached me to tell me Leah's passed away. This is the kind of communication, the excellent communication that I was brought up with. I mean, they're all, you can just throw a net over the whole bunch of them. They're, they're just nuts. And my wife never believed me about them until she met them. And um, my mom threw an engagement party for us, and my Aunt Rose came and wore her wig backwards, and it had a bun on it. And, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was not a mistake. It was a look she was going after. And um, she... <laughs> they were just... Insane, insane. Um, if you got anything for free in my family, it meant it was stolen. And uh, I had an uncle who was a welder who used to get free bales of steel wool. And um, my aunt took a decorating course and made throw pillows and filled all the throw pillows with the free steel wool. And uh, that stuff works its way through on you. So when you were at their house, if you looked at the room, Everybody was moving a little bit, you know, the whole, <laughs> the whole room was like a living, breathing, pulsing thing. Now, uh, I'm like a lot of you. I did not have alcoholism when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, one of the real big thrills about uh, this week for me is, is uh, I'm here with my sponsor, Paul, and there's a bunch of guys I sponsor are here, and there's some men who they sponsor uh, 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 that are here. So it's really thrilling for me to not only be part of the fellowship that's here, but to be part of the fellowship that's, uh, that I'm really, that, you know, that's my AA family. It's really an incredible feeling for me. And um, the fellowship that I was part of as, as a kid really gave me a one-way ticket out of alcoholism. I could not possibly have been alcoholic when I got here. I'm, I'm Jewish. Jews don't drink uh, because it, it, it might dull the pain, you know, and, and you, don't, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want that to happen. You don't want to squander any agony opportunity that presents itself. You want to be fully alert and there for any misery that comes down the pike. And... Um, in addition to the Judaism, I had been in psychotherapy for 18 years. By the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was going to be uh, dead, but I was going to understand it. And, um, and in addition to the dreaded Judaism and the psychotherapy, I, <laughs> I could not possibly have been an alcoholic. Uh, I was a dark, complicated, adventurous artist, but not an alcoholic. I just didn't have alcoholism. Uh, so if you're new here, stick around long enough to get a diagnosis. If you're a, if you're a drug addict, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're a dope fiend, which is somehow worse than any of us, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. A friend of mine uh, a couple of years ago heard a guy uh, identify as a crack monster, <laughs> which is just my personal favorite now. Uh, and if you're a tweaker, that's new. Tweaker, that's new. What the hell is that all about? Do they, like, come with batteries or something? What, what's that? Um, and I, I, didn't have, I didn't have that alcoholism. And I, I had the Judaism, and I had the psychotherapy. And my uncle was one of the top ten welterweights of the world. He was a boxer. His name was Izzy Redman. And he was concerned about anti-Semitism. He was fighting down in Atlanta, Georgia in 1939. And he uh, changed his name to Izzy Goldberg, so no one would know that he was Jewish when he was uh, fighting to himself. Now, I, I wish I was lying about this. this. These are my people. This is my genetic pool. You don't go to the bar and brag about this. I come from the biggest morons. You just don't. This is, you know, this is really scary stuff, especially for a little kid to grow up with this kind of wisdom around you. And... Um, but I didn't have the alcoholism. And I, I grew up in this nutty family, and I was uh, uh, in trouble really quick. I, I, uh, I tried to get into it with these guys, these guys who were drinking beer. I was into this alcoholic dilemma just from Jump Street, you know. And these guys were drinking beer, and I wanted to get in with them, and they were this gang. And this guy, George Rosenstein, was bringing me into this gang. I know I'm going to run into George again if he's still alive. I don't know if he's still alive, but I know I'm going to run into him somewhere, you know. He's probably like, you know, owns a recovery home, you know, now or something. Um, but uh, 
George was bringing me into this group of guys. There was a ring of guys around me, and he was teaching me how to steal cars because these guys drank beer and steal, stole cars. That's what they did. And he said, look, and I want to make my bones with these guys, you know. He said, we only do Chevy Biscaynes and Fairlanes. At that time, Chevy Biscaynes and Fairlanes had an ignition on the column, and they had off, on, and lock. He said, if it's on lock, shine the car. You punch out the fly window. Yes, there were fly windows then. You get in the car, and if it's on lock, shine it. If it's on off, take your house key, put it in the ignition, turn it on, and you're, you're cruising. And I looked around the group. I said, uh, what if it's on on? <laughs> he said, then someone's in the car, you moron. And uh, <laughs> I failed gang 101. Uh, it just didn't want to have anything to do with me. And... Um, so I just went to these other group of guys. It just didn't matter to me which group of guys. And there was other group of guys who had just... Start. At that time in the Bronx, if you wore bell-bottoms on a public conveyance, people moved away from you. They did, man. It was weird stuff. If, all you had to do was have the pants. And you were part of the group, you know? And they just moved away from you. And that looked great to me. Just a pair of pants, and you're special. They move away from you. is great. And these guys uh, were smoking pot... And, uh, boy, it was fun. It was really, really fun. I, and I, what I started then, because I got put into the psychotherapy at, really young at 14, because I started getting asked to, you know, drop it out of school and stuff like that. And, and, um, and I, I triumphed over the alcohol because I, I started drinking the alcohol. And I, I, I really got out of the alcohol right away with the marijuana. You know, and it, uh, I'd like to welcome all the pot smokers here tonight. You remember WOW, right? Wow. <laughs> wow. And right after WOW usually came... What? <laughs> what? Wow, what, wow, what, wow, what, what? Watching a pot smoker is like watching a dog try to run on linoleum. There's a lot of activity, but no movement. But they're very, very busy. They just can't get a claw in the rug. They cannot get anything moving at all. I triumphed over the marijuana with pills. I was victorious over pills with cocaine. Cocaine is, is an excellent drug. It's particularly good for sex if you enjoy sex from the Neolithic period. And uh, I, uh, I kicked that gall darn uh, cocaine with heroin. Heroin's a very, very exciting complicated, dark, artistic drug, uh, and then you cross the line and, and become a vomiting pig. It's just a little hop, skip, and a jump. And, uh, and then I drank till I didn't want to be a drunk. And um, when I was uh, going through this stuff as a teenager, my, uh, my father really thought he was a loser, and I absolutely agreed with him. I thought he was a chump. My pop never made more than $10,000 a year. My brother and I never went to school with ripped clothing, and I never missed a meal. My last year out there, I made $80,000. My kids missed meals all the time, and they went to school with ripped clothing all the time. How can such a thing happen? How can I put a, those two pictures of those two men down next to each other and come up with my dad being a sap? And I did over and over again. How easy, easy. If you're somebody with alcoholic tendencies and a certain kind of thinking becomes established in you, a certain kind of thinking. Oh, it's fabulous stuff, alcoholic thinking. The alcoholic mind is a fabulous Fabulous, never-ending source of mirth and entertainment. It's an extraordinary thing. The alcoholic mind is like the most perfectly tuned clock that keeps the most precise time in the universe for one minute and then skips a century. When it works, it is perfect. It is rhapsodic. It is, it's gorgeous. And when it doesn't, it leaves gaps large enough to move an entire culture through. It is an extraordinary thing. And... Um, I set some really lofty goals for myself because I was already caught in this alcoholic mire and I certainly wasn't going to be played like a sap like my old man and, you know, make money and bring it home. There was no way I was going to fall in that trap. And by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had reached or surpassed all those goals. By the time I got sober, I had a book on the bestseller list. I had acted in a Broadway play. I had directed a television show. I directed a film. I had, was an administrator of a theater in New York. I had done all of these things a time. I never got to do any of them more than once, because when I'd leave, they'd move the business so I couldn't find it again. 
And, and the reason why I didn't really find out until I, I took the alcoholic test. If you're new here, we've got a test for alcoholism. Other diseases, they've got x-rays and blood tests. We've got an inventory. And it's a, it's a, a pass, pass situation. If you do it, you'll pass. I guarantee it. And if you do it, if you write the whole thing down and read the whole terrible thing to somebody, you will see, actually see a picture of your alcoholism. And when I, and I mean the whole thing, I'm resentful at them, I'm resentful at me for resenting them, and I'm resentful at them for watching me resent them. And I've had sex with all of them. <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm scared of all, right? Now, if you're new, you might be asking yourself, what does this have to do with alcoholism? It is alcoholism. It's the spiritual tapeworm that will keep you in the cycle of spree and remorse until you're traded out. Until you're traded out, you're at zero, and you're hollow and insane and alone. It's the whole deal. And when I took the alcoholic test, I saw that people, like, at first were doing things behind my back, and then a little later on they started talking behind my back. And in the last few horrible years, they started thinking behind my back, which is terrible. It's hard to catch them. And, uh, but you, you, can, you can catch them if you accuse them of it all the time. If you accuse them of it all the time, you will catch the sons of bitches because eventually they'll be thinking, if he accuses me of it one more time, I'm going to kill him. And uh, I uh, uh, just did something horrible. Just... Just horrible. I, I, uh, I shot some dope, and my father had a massive stroke, and I was taken to the hospital, and I, I couldn't be there for him. I couldn't, couldn't answer the bell. I mean, I, the curtain was down. I, I, uh, I, I didn't find out he was sick and get loaded. I, I got loaded because I was awake, and he got sick. And, uh, and I, I, I went into the hospital. The sound of the heart machine couldn't even get through to me, couldn't penetrate that veneer, that narcotic veneer. I had holes in my arms, and I just felt like a pig, like an animal. There's a couple of times in a kid's life you ought to be there for his old man. This was one of them. Couldn't do it. Couldn't be there for my mother. Couldn't ever be there for my brother. And I collapsed. I collapsed as a man. I collapsed as a son. I collapsed. And I was never, ever going to live this down in my life, ever. And I was the only one who knew. And I really was. No one else did know. And um, my father was lost to me. I couldn't talk about him. I couldn't look at pictures of him when people discussed him. It just and, and the, the, the ouch, the ouch that happens at, at, at first, you you take that mind eating worm and you bake it for you, you nurture that for about 20 years until you make a terrible hollow sound when people hit you. When it's that in you that long. And it's one of those ouches that every recovering alcoholic knows. I don't care what your bottom is. I don't care what it is. You know that ouch that comes up and, and your heart falls apart. This black thing comes up on you and nothing is ever going to change in that situation. I've never met a recovering drunk that didn't have it. Sometimes we don't come in with it. Sometimes we find it. <laughs> sometimes, you know, if you're new and you're wondering when you're going to get in touch with your feelings, stay sober. They'll get in touch with you. <laughs> and I personally think my feelings are overrated. Uh, sometimes you hear people say they weren't in touch with their feelings when they came in. I was totally in touch with my feelings. I don't think I've ever been so in touch with my feelings than the day I walked in Alcoholics Anonymous. And there were rage, self-loathing, hatred. I, I knew them pretty good. So uh, shortly after my dad uh, passed away, and you see, the thing, the thing that happened to me that night, and it was that night that he died, I knew what had happened. I knew what the problem was, and I knew how to solve it. The problem was hypodermic needles and heroin. That's what exactly had brought me to that point in that time, and I knew how to solve the problem. Never put a needle in my arm again, and I didn't. I did it. And shortly after that, I was acting in a Broadway play, and a new usherette walked into that theater one night. I didn't even talk to her. I just took one look at her. I walked back in the dressing room. I stood up on a chair, and I announced to the male members of that cast, if anybody talks to the new usherette with long brown hair, I'll break all the bones in your hands and feet. And Nancy took a look at, uh, at my bio and saw I was a filmmaker and walked in the next day with a big book that said Orson Welles on it so I'd have a way to strike up a conversation with her. And I absolutely fell in love with this woman. The, 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 the earth opened up underneath me and I just, 
I adored her. She was exotic to me. She was from Detroit. And, um, and I, I thought there were like palm trees in Detroit. I, I really had not been out of the Bronx virtually at all. I mean, she... Uh, and, um, man, we were in our early 20s. I was acting on, in, on Broadway. We were living in the, one of the most exciting cities in the world. We just were having a great time. It was just great. The world was at our feet. And we weren't going anywhere. We were just a couple of dogs trying to run on linoleum. I mean, we were dead in our tracks. We had alcoholism. We didn't even know we had it. And Nancy became terribly, terribly sick uh, from prolonged exposure to me. And um, she became so ill. <laughs> One day I came home, we had these big tumblers in the house, and I popped a cork on a bottle of wine, and I emptied the entire bottle of wine into this glass. And I turned around, and she was looking at me like this. And I said, what? And she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm having a glass of wine. <laughs> Can't a man have a glass of wine in his own home? We became so sick that at one point we didn't have money for the rent and uh, uh, Big Duh there. And um, uh, a guy had lent us his car and we sold his car. And I, what, what had happened, we didn't... <laughs> We didn't have money for the rent. It was the end of the month. I looked into my wife's eyes and I said, sweetheart, look, I am so sick of acting like a punk, irresponsible kid. <laughs> I am so sick of it. Let's stand on our own two feet. Let's not borrow money. Let's do the right thing. Let's sell the car. Now, I will never forget this guy's voice on the phone. When I, he said, you sold my car? I lent you. That's like house sitting for someone and they come back and you're in escrow, you know? And, and the alcoholic life becomes the only normal one and we were sure we had done the right thing. Because my wife looked at me in the eyes and said, let's do. Now I understand that. I understand how we sold the car. I understand it. It's the same way that I used to get excited when I was told that I needed dental surgery. It's the same thing. Normal people don't, there's heads going like this, that you don't get that at the Lions Club. Only at an AA meeting do people go, oh, dental surgery. <laughs> it's an uninterrupted source of narcotics for a period of time. You know, they get a little drool in their mouth, their eyes glaze over, dental surgery. <laughs> Normal people don't get excited about dental surgery. And I'll tell you why. For the same reason we were able to sell the car. I leave out the middle part. I leave out the middle part. I have always left out the middle. I go from announcement of dental surgery to painkiller. I leave out surgery. I leave out surgery, scalpel, sutures, blood, and pain. I leave that out. <laughs> I leave out the middle. I go from, let's do the right thing, sell the car. I leave out grand theft auto. I, I leave, that's what I leave out. I leave out forging the name on the pink slip. I leave out all of that stuff. So if you're new here, welcome to the middle. <laughs> I'm sure that's really good news for you. We're real big on the middle here, you know? <laughs> I will never forget when I called that guy to pay him back. He said, you're paying me back? <laughs> he was like, it was like he was frozen on that end of the phone the whole time. Um, we had two beautiful sons. We had Micah, who was really welcomed into the world, and Jesse, who was really not welcomed into the world. By the time Jesse was born, it just hurt too much to be around us. It just, uh, just hurt too much. And uh, Micah had been really welcomed. There was f phone calls and flowers and a lot of people in the hospital. And uh, by the time Jesse came, just uh, the ice around our heart had become so thick it really had repelled everybody. And... Um, the night he was born, he had a heart problem. He was taken up into neonatal intensive care. And uh, I got a call from a doctor that night. And he, the doctor said, Mr. Redmond, your wife's in really in a tremendous amount of psychological duress. She's in big trouble. The kid's up in an incubator. There's nobody here. We need you to come down. And I said, I, have, I can't find anybody to watch my two-year-old son. And she said an incredible thing to me. She said, I tell you what, my husband's at home. Why don't I give you my phone number? Give him a call. You can bring your kid over to my house and my husband will watch him. 
a pretty astounding offer from a stranger and a doctor to boot. And I said no. I said no because I could not bear to take a minute and look at what had happened to us. I couldn't do it. I couldn't accept this woman's generosity and her kindness because I think I would have had to, I would have had to just take a little look. And that black shadow, that big ouch was so big. I used to have a phrase I, I used to say to myself all the time, I can't fit the pain in my head. I can't. It's too big to fit in my head. I can't do it. And this is the condition that we wound up in in Alcoholics Anonymous three years later. Three years later, by that time, the boys were just nuts. Our older son was six. Our younger son was three. Micah's small motor skills were all screwed up from being distracted all the time. He could barely read or write. Uh, Jesse was, you know, Jesse couldn't stop playing games with robots because it just was safer not to be a person. He couldn't get this war game out of his head. That's the corner that he got driven into. And... Um, and Nancy and I were just these two frozen, wooden, beaten people. And uh, th this is where we wound up. This was a good, good day in the Redmond home. Th this was where we. This, this is where our goals wound up. I went to a doctor. The doctor said, "Mr. Redmond, uh, you have high blood pressure. You're going to have to lose some weight." And I said to him, "Look, I would like to do that, but I drink alcohol and I smoke marijuana before I go to bed every night, so I'm not going to be able to." And <laughs> And he said, why don't I prescribe some medication for you? And I said, what a country. And uh, he, <laughs> he prescribed for me chloral hydrate. Now, chloral hydrate, if you've ever seen those 30s films where they, uh, there's an unruly sailor in a bar and they pour a little white powder in his drink and he drinks it and falls backwards like a potted palm, that's uh, chloral hydrate. It's a uh, Mickey. It's a knockout drop. And I love these pills. I love them. I love them. I love these pills. So Nancy comes home. I'm taking handfuls of knockout drops and I'm slamming my arms into the hallway wall to keep myself awake to enjoy my Mickey. You don't want to just pass out and not enjoy the Mickey. You don't want to waste your knockout drop. So I'm slamming myself into the wall to keep myself conscious enough to enjoy the Mickey until I just short circuit and just keel over and pass out. So now I'm going to bed, but I can't wake up to go to the bathroom because I've got all this knockout dropping me, so I'm become incontinent like the rest of the 30-year-old men in America. And, um, <laughs> but one night, I got up and wet the wall. And that morning, everyone was excited. He wet the wall. He's moving towards the bathroom. It's progress, not perfection. Things are looking up. There's a change. You know what I mean? It's okay. It's going to be okay. He wet the wall. Dad wet the wall. My son Micah came to me when he was five years old and he said, Dad, is there anything such as God? And I looked into the eyes of my perfect five-year-old baby boy and I said, no, Micah, there isn't. And I swear to you, I thought I was giving him the real deal. I swear to you, I thought I was saving him some skin that he wouldn't have to be played like those saps and suckers out there. And what I was in essence was doing was telling a five-year-old baby, you know, when it's late at night and you're all alone and you can't go to sleep and it's dark and you're scared, tough because that's all there is. That's really what I was telling them. On April 20th, 1985, I crossed the line I swore I would never cross again. I crossed the line that even though my careers were gone, my life had run out between my fingers like a handful of water, my wife and I were absolutely ranting lunatics. The kids were sick. I told you the kind of physiological shape they were in. But everything was, as long as I didn't put a needle in my arm, everything was okay. And on April 20th, 1985, I crossed the line. I crossed it. I put a needle in my arm. Why? Because it was there. And uh, my wife knew something was really wrong because I was acting in a way I had never acted before. And I was acting, you guys know exactly how I was acting. I couldn't imagine a life with alcohol or without it. I had reached the jumping off place. And just when I was driving on Mulholland Drive, the idea of just putting the car just two degrees right was just became easy. It wasn't dramatic. It wasn't a big deal. It was very, very acceptable. I called a friend of mine who used to drink with me who had stopped drinking and had gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that night I went to my first AA meeting and I saw Earl Hightower's sponsor speak that night. And um, I got it that night. I got it from Donald Madden that night. Uh, I'll tell you what I believe that Don, Donald Madden did that night. I went to Midway Hospital. 
He said, I heard a grown man share that he had not opened his mail in a year before he got sober. I had never heard a grown-up ever admit that in my entire life. I had not read our mail probably in several years or God knows when. <clears throat> and um, Earl Sponsor was an interior designer, and he, had a, he uh, wrote a nationally syndicated column. And while he was locked up in the maximum security nut ward in Camarillo, he continued to publish this column. And the, column, the name of the column was A Design for Living. <laughs> <laughs> and he shared it that night. I just sat with my jaw in my lap because everybody's laughing. I mean, people are laughing and identifying. And I said, I was shocked. For, I was a little appalled that he would admit this to a group of other people. But, and then the other thing that happened when he talked that night is that people talked to him there was a question and answer at the end of the meeting and people talked about having heard him before about respecting him about how much he had helped them there was something at work here that was completely foreign to me there was an identification and a sharing and an enrichment people's lives were informing each other in a way that was helping them this is a completely foreign concept to me at this point in my life. The only thing I was going to inform you of was that I had hit on your wife while I was borrowing $20 from you and rifling your medicine cabinet while I was pissing on your toilet seat. That was really the only thing I had to bring to the party at that point. That's if I had been allowed in your house that night. This was completely, completely different for me. I was so impressed, I, I uh, drank the next day. And I, uh, uh, my wife was telling the story when she talked the other day. I went home. A guy, uh, some people brought some wine over to our house. I poured myself a glass of wine. I drank it, and my wife's looking at me like this for a change. And I said, "What?" She said, "Do you drink in AA?" And I said, oh, "Yes, you drink in AA. They're not fanatics. You have an occasional glass of wine. These are <laughs> these are civilized people." Then the next day, I went to a. a, a, a a uh, group called the Sundowners in L.A., the Leather Jacket in August meeting, uh, what we used to wear, what we started to wear, and what we're wearing now, and uh, drank immediately after going to that meeting, and then the next day, woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, put on my best clothes, got a bad check to write you, and went down to sign up for the a and A to Unit A in the deep San Fernando Valley, and walked into that meeting, Walked into that meeting and took one look around and I said, oh my God, I could, I just hated everything about Alcoholics Anonymous. I guess something in me knew that I was done, you know, and I, I loathed it. I loathed it. Everything was a miracle. Miracle, miracle, miracle. I'm a miracle. You're a miracle. The coffee's a miracle. The furniture's a miracle. I'm a miracle. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, what, what, when do we hook a rug, you know? I mean, I, I, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. And I'm waiting for the Jew hunt to start, too. You know, I know, I know that's next on the schedule, you know. Here, Jaime, strap on these antlers, we'll count to ten. Give you a good running start, going to hook you with a sharp stick. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I hated everything about AA. The only reason that I think that I stayed that I can imagine that I stayed is that I was out of plans. And if you're new here, I pray for you that you're out of plans. If you're new here, I pray for you that you're out. If you've got a plan and you're new, it's probably a butte. <laughs> Don't use your plan. Grab one of us after the meeting and tell us your plan. <laughs> we want to know the plan. <laughs> now, my favorite newcomer plan, and I guarantee you it could be a real popular one where we are right now, is the one more dope deal to set myself up financially for sobriety plan. <laughs> now, if you didn't think of it already, it isn't a suggestion, okay? It's probably the wrong place and the wrong time to share that particular idea. If you're doing any mulein this week. I stuck around Alcoholics Anonymous for six months and enjoyed the gift of step none. <laughs> uh, I didn't do anything. I received uh, a commensurate payment for the nothing I was doing and received nothing. 
and uh, got absolutely nuts, just got sick. And I had seen the AA drill hundreds and hundreds of times in just six months. People came in, did the work, changed. People came in, didn't do the work, didn't change, got sick, got sicker, got to the podium, shared their gift with us, and shared their ass right out of the door, or stayed and became columns of human sewage and sexual predators, although I judge no man. <laughs> I knew I was going to drink. My wife had reached out to the Al-Anon family groups and our sons had become a little less frightened. I knew I was going to drink, so I asked a guy to sponsor me. Because the demonstration of the power of God had already appeared in my house in the form of my wife and her sponsor and what she had done. She tells me that she had already seen me change. I didn't see it in me. I saw it in her. And I got a good guy. I got a really good guy who seemed really happy and always got up there and talked about the work. And I want to tell you something, if you're new here, and, and sharing is confusing, please read this book. Read this book. It'll clear the whole thing up for you. If you can read it with some people who are already familiar with it, all the better. Because if you read this book, you'll start going to AA meetings and saying, oh, oh, he's talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. He's not talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know what he's talking about. But again, I judge no man because I'm too spiritually developed. Um, sometimes I can walk into an AA meeting and not even hear a passing reference made to God, the big book, or the steps. And if I'm in a meeting and all I'm hearing about is issues and boundaries, I get very, very confused. I'm not putting issues and boundaries down. The, here's the deal, though. You've got to not drink. You've got to not drink to have an issue or, and a boundary. If you don't drink, you will have an issue and a boundary. I guarantee it. Uh, but you've got to not drink. The not drinking part's a moose. If it was not for the not drinking part, we would be a much bigger organization. I guarantee it. But it's that goddamn not drinking thing. It really screws a lot of people up. So don't drink. When you, if you're new, when you want to drink, don't. Don't drink. Um... This guy uh, made sure I'd done some reading from the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he invited me to his house, and he read Chapter 5 to me, and on the way through, he took me through the first two steps. We reached Step 3, we said a prayer together, and uh, he finished Chapter 5, and he went back and he gave me instructions on how to do a fourth step from the Big Book of AA. Now, I, I, uh, I had a lot of work to do. It took me three months to do that inventory. I went back and I read it to him at five months of sobriety, at nine months of sobriety. I did step six and seven for the first time, and it came time to do my eight-step list. I try to share this any time I talk. I, it's the best reading of the eight-step I've ever heard in my life. It was done in my old home group, this men's group in North Hollywood, and it was, I heard it from a guy named Nino. I'd never heard him before this night. I've never heard him since. I've never even seen the guy since. He was, had a heavy New York accent. He had never read Chapter 5 before. He was there with a hospital group. He had hospital plastic on his wrist, and he, and he read Chapter 5 for the first time, and he got up to Step 8, and he read, made a list of all those we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Jesus Christ! <laughs> and he, he looked out into the room as if to say, have you seen this? <laughs> Do you know what is in here, man? It's the only thing I saw when I saw the steps. I saw nothing else. Not that money. I would not have taken that much money if I knew I had to give it back. <laughs> right? Not the car. <clears throat> if you knew... Don't worry, it's eight steps from where you are anyway, for God's sake. And it's really not eight that's the annoying one. It's nine. Nine's a pain in the ass. I wrote up my eight-step list. My pop went down and my wife and my kids went down. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I had to not be on my eight-step list. I know a lot of people put themselves on their eight-step list. I know a lot of people put themselves on the top of their eight-step list. I sponsor plenty of guys who put themselves on their eight-step list. I got no beef with anybody who does it. But I've been asked to share my story tonight, and I, and I heard people talking about putting their eight, themselves on their eight-step list, and I kind of had to hear from people who weren't doing it to know that it was okay that I wasn't. I had been making amends to Scott Redmond at your expense my whole life, and I needed to, I really needed to not be on the eight-step list. And I judge nobody, and I'm really quite serious about this. You guys have, everybody's got their own path to God, and this was mine. It was very helpful to me to make sure that I wasn't on there. And uh, I started... Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And my sponsor, and I don't know, you know, I don't know if this is something he did with all the guys he sponsors. I, I have really no idea. I just know that he wouldn't tell me how to make amends. He just wouldn't do it. 
I said, what am I going to do about Nancy and the kids? What am I going to do about my pop? He's dead. And he said, I don't know. I don't know. Do your job. Do your job in A.N. And I just I had to start doing a lot of lame crap. Lame, 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 lame. I had to start, like, going to Little League games, coaching flag football, running a reading group in the elementary school. Lame, 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 lame. First time I go to a Little League game, Nancy comes to the game. She looks over the first base stands and starts laughing. There's all the people in the first base stands, and there's me alone in the sun, pissed off. Right, psychotic. I'm here. I'm doing my job. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm doing my job. I'm making amends. I'm here. The kids were really thrilled to see me. Mr. Redman's going to blow up, man. Look at him. Look at him. He's going, he's going up and down two hat sizes. Oh, man. It took me a couple of years for the voices to diminish in volume and number to go and sit with the people in the stands, to just be with the people in the first base stands. And a couple of years ago, our son Jesse received one of the greatest compliments I think a human being can receive in this world. He... Uh, was intentionally walked at a game. I don't think it really gets a lot better than that. If you're not a baseball fan, <laughs> that means uh, they were scared of him and they wanted to get to the weenie behind him. And, uh, <laughs> and they walked him and he didn't want to jump up and down and be lame, you know. He just laid his bat down and he trotted up the first base stands and on the way up the first, ba- up the first base line, he turned to me and I'm at my sobriety station in the first base stands. And he turned to me and he just shot me just a little stuff. Just that much stuff. You don't want to spoil him. Don't be lame. It's the old man, you know, just a little bit. And, and he trotted up to first base. I could have missed the whole thing. I could have missed the, thing, the whole thing. And I've been with enough men who have been drunk on their kid's birthday one more time. And I tell them about the day that my kid got walked. And I was there. I didn't hear about it from anybody. Last Halloween, I was driving around, going to an AA uh, function, and uh, I looked out. You know, Halloween's just so great. Kids are running through the street. They're so excited. It's such a great thing, you know? And, uh, and I'm looking out of my car, and I got hit with that feeling I've gotten hit with a million times. I'm really convinced it started the night that I saw Donald talk, and I heard him talk about not opening his mail, because I... It, I I became part of something that night. I heard something that night that my wife and I have experienced together with our AA and Al-Anon family times a million since. But Halloween, I looked out of my window in my car and I was overwhelmed with that feeling of being part of what was going on in the world that night. I wasn't looking out of my window saying, oh my God, why can't I participate in this? Why does this just make me feel like shit? Because my wife, for 12 years, has spent a few bucks on some candy and a jack-o'-lantern and made sure that people had, you know, sometimes I've participated, sometimes I've not. It's mainly her, you know, but I've been able to watch her enjoy it. I've been able to participate on whatever level I do. So if you exercise that muscle enough, of course it's going to feel strong. If you exercise that when you stop sending the kid into school to catch the bullet, you go to the school, he's sick. He goes to school. Now, you go to school and you sit down with a teacher and say, he's really sick because he's lived with me. I'm terribly ill. We've got a horrible problem. Can you help us? We're sick from alcoholism. He's got these tics and he can't stop making these clicking noises with his throat. He can't stop grinding his teeth because he's distracted because he's been so scared. We are so scared. Can you help us? Instead of just sending the kid in to take the bullet one more time, because if he takes the bullet, I don't have to. And the kids got tested, and they got resources cut loose for them in the L.A. Unified School District. And our kids have just gotten great educations, and they really started getting great. They just started getting great, you know. I was sober a couple of years, and I was making the boys lunch. And I said to Michael, what do you want on your uh, hot dog? And he said, I want mustard, onions, and lettuce. And I said, lettuce? He said, oh, okay, I don't want lettuce. And he walked away and he came back about 45 minutes later and he looked at me directly in the eyes and I'm not altering one syllable. He said to me, I will never again allow your opinion of what I want affect what I ask for. So I asked him to sponsor me at that point. What's that? What the hell is that? 
couple of years later, Jesse broke his wrist in a, in a growth plane, which if you know about the way kids develop, it's cartilage that's going to turn to bone. And once it's set, it cannot be messed with. It's very, very important. They're brothers, so they're beating the crap out of each other two minutes after he gets home. I get right up in Micah's face and I yell at him to let him know this is a, a boundary that can't be crossed. He can't mess with his brother until this gets better. He walks away from me and slams the door of his room. He slammed the door. So now I got the dead tick going, you know, and I got to go because he slammed the door. So I open the door and before I can unload at him, he looks at me and says, hold it. I didn't tell you you were wrong out there. You were right. But a big guy just got in my face and screamed and yelled. I didn't tell you you were wrong. Don't tell me I can't be mad. a fear of confrontation and telling somebody how you feel without telling them what to do and demanding the same respect. That's what that is. That's what he's been watching. I had a guy I sponsored when I was about a year sober named Roland and Roland's just a great guy, a sweet, sweet man. And he used to call our house every single night and he'd leave a message on our machine every night and he'd say, Scott, it's Roly. I'm sober. I love you. Good night. And he'd hang up. When I was six years sober, our son Micah came to me and he said, you know, Dad, when you, you first got sober, I couldn't fall asleep until I heard Roland's voice on the machine. And once I heard Roland's voice on the machine, I knew it was okay and I, I'd go to sleep. Because Roland's voice was the demonstration of the power of God in our life. I'm sorry it didn't work. I'm sorry meant nothing for me. He knew that Roland wouldn't call if I was drinking. I told him there was no God. I looked at this five-year-old boy and I said, there is no God in your universe. And you guys said, screw you. We'll come in through the answering machine. We'll come in through the back door. We'll come and get you. We're going to come and get him and we're going to come and get your sorry ass. And that's just the way it is. And you did. You did. Because we stayed open and we stayed willing and we let you in. And um, Mike is just great. He's... Uh, it makes me feel very close to him down in Mexico. He uh, uh, graduated high school and uh, took a year off to come down. I, I, I feel like the federalists are going to descend on me the second I say this. Uh, he came down to work with the Zapatista revolutionaries in Chiapas for six months uh, after he graduated because he felt that uh, Nancy and I weren't uh, close enough to God. And um, <laughs> for that six months, I just raised my hand at a meeting. They call on me and I go, He was part of something called the peace camps, installations of Westerners that go to indigenous villages and make sure that the, uh, uh, that the uh, Indians weren't abused by the Mexican military. What a guy. You know, he, uh, Micah paid Alcoholics Anonymous, my favorite compliment. Now I'm going to share it with you guys. It's a compliment for you guys. The year before he went up to college, he's up at college now. He's a college guy. He's up at a big old hippie college up in Washington where you can get a soy latte. <laughs> if you can gack that down. And uh, it's just great. And um, he was babysitting for a couple on the uh, program. And um, he was babysitting for this couple, and the guy said to him, uh, what do you think of hearing your dad talking AA? And Michael looked at this guy and said, you know, I don't really know about that. I don't really give a crap about it. You know, He said, all I can tell you is since I'm a very little boy, the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon have taken very, very good care of me and never once has one of them demanded that I believe what they believe. What an extraordinary thing to say about a group of people. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. I mean, that's not, that's not evangelism, it's not promotion, it's not bullying, it's not blackmail. It's exactly what Dr. Bob said you will get if you boil down all 12 steps. If you boil him down, he said you will get love and service. That's what he said you'll get. And that Micah's expression of it was such a pure... And now, that's based not on some people-pleasing remark he wants to make to this guy. That's based on 12 years of his practical experience with members of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. He's got uncles in the room. Guys who have been a big, big part of his life, who he adores, who he trusts. You know. Um... If you're new here, I want to welcome you to AA. I'm, uh, uh, 
I hope you're a little more thrilled for me now than you are at the beginning of the meeting. I, uh, <laughs> uh, at 10 years of sobriety, I had a, a big, um, uh, really difficult time. I needed to switch sponsors. Uh, my first sponsor was a great guy, just a wonderful guy, and I, I needed to move on. And I got Paul uh, as a sponsor three years ago. And my spiritual life has just broadened immensely as a result of my being ready to grow and his... Uh, wonderful, loving, tender influence on me. Um, and uh, my wife and I really, uh, really released each other with love. We released each other so much we lost track of each other. We completely released each other. And uh, I was used to be fond of saying that my, we stopped working on our relationship. My, uh, my, my idea of working on a relationship was to talk to you until you changed your mind. Um, <laughs> Talk to you until your eyes rolled back in your head and you just keeled over and on the way down you went, oh, okay. (laughs) And uh, we really had to start becoming reacquainted in sobriety. And we've worked very hard at it and we've gotten, we've really gotten nutty. We've gone through a lot of stuff and we recently started praying together in a way that has really had a profound impact on both of us. And we've been going to therapy together and, and, uh, and the other day it just occurred to me that the prayer, that what we were finally able to break through in the prayer was exactly what we were trying to develop in the therapy and that this prayer was probably going to make it possible for us to stop going, doing the therapy in a, in, a, in, a, in a really positive way for us. I'm not putting therapy down. As long as I'm not trying to treat alcoholism with it, I don't, it's an outside issue as far as I'm concerned. Treating uh, uh, alcoholism with psychotherapy is like showing up at a gunfight with a knife. It's a, a terrible, terrible misguided chore, um, in my humble opinion. Boy. Uh, and I'm very excited about our marriage. I'm very excited about what's happening in our family. I want to tell you, I don't think it's because God likes us more than the people who are getting divorced or whose kids stayed sick. I just don't. I don't buy it. It's just what's happening at our house. When Micah got thrown out of high school for selling drugs, that what was going on in ours. Paul said th- something to me, one of the most useless pieces of information he's ever given me. I, I called him uh, when Micah was in Chiapas, and I'm telling you, I was so scared. I'm a Jewish kid who was shown these horrible pictures of concentration camps when I was a kid. They weren't explained to me. This is all over my inventory. I got bad stuff with this. And I'm thinking, you know, all I'm seeing is this Oliver Stone film, you know, my kids down in Chiapas. Chiapas, and I can't keep these things out of my head. And Paul said to me, maybe this is like the biggest thing that's going to happen to him. Maybe this is going to be such a, a, a life-changing thing. Well, he's like the star of his college. He's gone through this thing. People like flock to him to find out about this stuff. You know, Nancy and I go through this funny thing. We say, well, do you think he can do this? And we go, he's been to Chiapas. He can do it. We're thinking, can he deposit the money in the account? <laughs> He's been part of an international incident. I mean, what, what, can, the, what can the kid not do? You know? Um, we were nailed in the North, Northridge earthquake really bad. And uh, we got hurt physically and, and just real bad. And shortly after the quake, we were at an AA function out of town. And this woman at this function came up to me and she said... Oh, I'm so glad God got us out of L.A. before the quake. So I said to her, so he likes you. He likes you, but we're crap, but he likes you. And she said to me, she said to me I guess he just felt you had some lessons to learn. Oh, bartender. Hello. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. If I got a guy up there saying, get the Redmond boy, get him. No evacuation plan for you, Jew boy. Get him. Get him. Kill his wife. Turn her to salt. Kill his goat. Put a finger in his eye. Get him. The God of my forefathers. The God of Sukkot. <laughs> oh, that's Sukkot, God. I'm out of here. I want to have, I want nothing to do with it. I, for me, now I know that God's keeping her sober, that God wouldn't keep me sober for 10 seconds. I get today, God is spirituality and earthquakes are geology and that's just the way it is. That's what's happening in our, in our, I'm sure you can pull up to that, that's fine. Um, 
if I live on a house on the hill or I live in a refrigerator box, I've got to do my job in AA. If Nancy and I are together or we're apart, I've got to, either my job is going to be showing a guy how to have a loving, developing, working relationship or showing a guy how to go through a sober divorce. I've got to do my job in Alcoholics Anonymous. I just, for me, they ain't divvying stuff up up there. I won't stay sober through it. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I'm not telling you what your God needs to do. I'm just telling you what my God's doing for me. Um, the good news is our problem mainly rests in our mind. The bad news, our problem mainly rests in our mind. <laughs> if you're new, I want to just urge you to catch alcoholism. Just catch alcoholism. Get a diagnosis and catch the alcoholism. If you've been drinking at exactly the wrong moment, if you've been building up an outlook, a bright outlook for yourself and your family and bringing it down around your ears in a senseless series of sprees, if you fail to recall with sufficient force the memory of the pain and humiliation of a day, a week, a second ago, and repeat the same insane behavior over and over again, you could be an alcoholic. <laughs> if you're not, what is wrong with you? <laughs> what the hell is your problem? What is wrong with you? Consider the alternatives. What else is wrong with you? Catch alcoholism. It's really the easier, softer way compared to what you could have, you know? Um, I heard my sponsor, uh, my sponsor uh, was the first, uh, Max was the first Al-Anon speaker we ever heard at a function for Vesper House when I was in my first year of sobriety. And I heard Paul share something that night that I've never uh, forgotten. He, sh he said that uh, that the treatment for alcoholism actually leaves this. It's the only it was the one of the like the only uh, fatal illness he knew of where the, the the treatment left the patient in better condition than they were in before they contracted the disease. Wow, I'll take alcoholism. I'll take that. This is the only book uh, about uh, uh, recovery from fatal illness that contains the sentence we absolutely insist on enjoying life. There's no book about cholera that says. <laughs> Cholera is a hoot. It's a hoot. You'll love cholera. <laughs> you'll meet other people with cholera. A blast. Then you'll meet people who just caught cholera. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> the bad news is our problem mainly rests in our mind. Um, uh, some years ago, I met a guy at a meeting. I came home and he called me. He was a new guy and he called me and he talked to me for an hour and I said, uh-huh, four times so he'd know uh, that I wasn't dead. And he told me he had been stalking several women and he had a restraining order taken out against him. But everything's different now. He's 11 days sober and it's all different. And then at the end of the hour, he said to me, geez, I feel so alone. And I said, I just listened to you for an hour without interrupting. I don't even know you, man. What do you mean you feel alone? And he said, well, I don't have a woman. And I said, what would you be bringing to a relationship right now besides the stalking skills? <laughs> what are you bringing to the party, pal? People two weeks into remission from leukemia are and having dating problems. Alcoholics are. Alcoholics are. Our problem mainly rests in our mind. Some years ago, my wife was walking through our bedroom. I was on the phone with a newcomer, and she heard me saying to the phone, let's say the aliens are coming. <laughs> she stopped short. She ain't going to miss a second of this. I said, look, that's an outside interest. I'm not telling you the aliens aren't coming. I have one question for you. Why are they coming for you? Why have they traversed the universe for your sorry ass? You're nine days sober. You have no life. You live in North Hollywood. Why have they come for you? Plus, he's sleeping with a Bible on his chest to ward them off. So they're going to come across a whole galaxy, walk into his room and go, oh, no, the Bible. Let's go home. Now, I I have to tell you, I have to tell you that I was telling this story, I was talking one night, and the guy who it was, was in the audience, and I watched him go like this, <laughs> oh shit, <laughs> and I saw the whole thing, it was me, <laughs> bad night for him, man, really bad night. <laughs> if you're new, I, uh, I want to welcome you to AA. I, uh, I, uh, we can do a lot of stuff for you. We can help you find a job. We can help you find a place to live. We can lend you a few bucks. We can buy you a cup of coffee. But none of us can ever work a step for you. Not one of them.
Not anybody here or anybody in this world can ever work any of these steps for you. You know, if the aliens are coming for you, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome home. Thanks so much for having me. Folks. <laughs>